Charles Pathé, or Charles Pathé as we call him, was born near Paris in 1853 and came into films almost by accident when he was 40. He lived to be 104, watching his name become a household word all over the world. Pathé was French agent for the phonograph, invented by that prolific American Thomas Alva Edison. But he soon became more interested in another Edison machine, the kinetoscope, a penny in the slot film projector. But Edison's films were expensive, and so Pathé and his brother Emile were soon competing with their own films. With the baby projector, born in 1922, Patty Cinema hoped to create a new market in the home for pictures which had already toured the cinema circuit. <laughs> to make good quality copies cheaply, they printed three strips of film, without margins, side by side on 35mm stock. After perforating and slitting, each strip was 9.5mm wide. The price of a home movie projector in 1924 was five pounds, and more than a hundred thousand of them were sold. The accessories were extra, of course. All the early projectors had a cunning device which allowed the manufacturers to cram more screen time into their standard 30-foot spool. Titles on the baby cine film were just a couple of frames long. A notch cut in the side of the film stopped each title in the projector gate just long enough for the audience to read. In fact, any static scene was treated in the same way and uh, padded out with subtitles some 30-foot cassettes ran for anything up to 20 minutes. Some features on the early 9.5 equipment were almost prophetic. Anticipating modern cartridge loading projectors by more than 40 years, Pathé packed their films in enclosed metal spools. And a similar cassette loading system was used when the baby camera appeared in 1923. It's best to do this in the dark, by the way. Films sold for two and sevenpence a row, with an extra two bob for processing, and filmmaking came within reach of the working man's pocket for the first time. Of course, makers of early home movies had very little to go on by way of um, printed advice. Alan Caster is an amateur who makes his own films on 9.5 today. He has a healthy respect for those pioneers of the 20s and their primitive equipment. Um, so far as such things as judging exposure and so on were concerned, um, many of them used the small Watkins B-meter. This, uh, the operator simply uh, exposed a bromide, a piece of bromide photographic paper down here and then counted the number of seconds that it took for that to uh, match a printed specimen here and then read off those number of seconds in the dial around the edge to uh, discover his, his exposure. Uh, indoor photography, of course, uh, for Cine was um, uh, a problem and um, in, if, uh, from the uh, point of view of providing enough light and it's tempting to suppose that many of them may have used uh, magnesium ribbon such as this one um, I could add perhaps that um, all 9.5 film has always been on a non-inflammable base which is perhaps just as well Two of the boffins behind 9.5 in those pioneer days were a French engineer, Louis Didier, and Arthur Samuel Newman, an Englishman who specialized in film transport mechanism. To begin with, the Pathé factory was at Vincennes, but later it was moved to this new site on the banks of the River Marne at Joinville, and it was here that most 9.5 cameras and projectors were designed and made. Nine Five's first home in England was in Lyle Street, off London's Leicester Square. In the early 1930s, Patiscope Limited moved to Cricklewood, and 262 North Circular Road became a shrine for amateur cine enthusiasts throughout the empire. And why not? Even His Majesty the King was a Nine Five.
Not just Pathé, nor Pathoscope, but a host of other manufacturers too, made both cameras and projectors. Some even tried to combine both camera and projector as one. I remember I had one called a Mida. Over the years, equipment has become more modern, and even today, uh, continental manufacturers introduce new models. But 9.5 is used today by a minority of amateur filmmakers. One reason may be that Pathé failed to respond quickly enough to the challenge of cheap home movie making in colour, first issued by Kodak's 8mm gauge in the 30s. They preferred to keep the emphasis firmly on projectors and on printed package films. But whatever the side effects, the films they release over 40 years still provide a happy hunting ground for enthusiastic collectors like Gerald McKee. 9.5 really started out as a home entertainment medium rather than as an amateur movie making gauge. And um, when they first got underway with this particular form of entertainment, they made large numbers of prints of professional films in shortened form. Later on, when the uh, 9.5 equipment was made such that you could take longer films, they were able to produce really acceptable prints of some of the classics of the cinema. And it is on 9.5 that many of these have been preserved. The Outlaw with veteran Western hero William S. Hart. Ruth Rowland having a hair-raising trip in Towards the Abyss. Fishers of the Isle, starring Sandra Milawanoff and Charles Vanell. For the gentleman, Raquel Mellor in Violet's Imperial. And for the ladies, Douglas Fairbanks in a comedy called A Man's Life. The Tempest, a drama with Gloria Swanson. This looks like the same scene all over again, but this time it's from The Wrecker, starring Benita Hume and Carlisle Blackwell. In 1938, the first sound prints arrived. Four years earlier, Pathé had introduced 17.5 mm sound on film, but the gauge was a commercial failure. But the 9.5 Vox, taking its name from the Latin word for voice, was an instant success. Sound for the home showman became a reality for the first time. The quality of the sound was very good and it really was a level pegger with 16mm. I think it's a great pity that 9.5 sound was cut short by the war. Projectors weren't available because they came from France and with the invasion of France they weren't available from this source. But 16mm, instead of being affected by the war, went on even to greater things. It was used as a medium for entertaining the forces so that after the war the technology that went into the printing of 16mm films was improved by the war, not spoilt by it, whereas 9.5 had to go back to scratch and start all over again. Although 9.5's fortunes never fully recovered from the disruption which the war caused to the French industry, new equipment appeared throughout the 50s, some of it made in England. Although, to a great extent, the success of 8mm made Pathoscope's efforts to promote 9.5 look like a losing battle, they did try. Magnetic stripe sound for the amateur was launched with the orator attachment and the Marignan projector. The Marignan was the first amateur stripe projector in any gauge, but it cost £190, quite enough to frighten off most people in 1955. It's interesting that 9.5 as an entertainment medium 
began to fall off during the 1950s. During that period of time, you found that the cinema audiences were dropping off, and as 9.5 had always remained a projectionist gauge rather than a movie-making gauge, you found that 9.5 began to fall off in the same way. And the result was that it paralleled the cinema themselves in that people tended to go, well, tended to stay at home and watch television rather than put 9.5 films on their home screen. In 1955, Pathé offered the only complete widescreen system ever placed on the amateur market and at the same time made one final desperate attempt to compete with 8mm running costs. In fact, they copied the 8mm double run exactly. Today, there is a flourishing interest in amateur widescreen, but in 1956, Pathoscope's triumph was premature. The change to duplex meant a complete change of equipment. The Monaco projector cost nearly 80 pounds. Duplex was soon forgotten, but not by Ken Valentine. He has good reason to remember it. Two or three thousand of the camera mechanisms were brought over from France to be assembled in this country. After some 18 months, it was found that the idea wasn't very good, the sales were very, very low, and I was one of the people who had to convert them back to standard 9.5. Even before the duplex disaster, the financial foundations at Cricklewood were starting to shake. The Pat camera was not Pathoscope's only coronation year achievement. 1953 was also the year the company paid its last dividend. In 1959, the French parent company sold its controlling interest to a British businessman. Pathoscope Great Britain Limited then expanded into 8mm and 16mm equipment but they also made yet another effort to break into the popular market with 9.5. There were strong rumours of American orders when they introduced the Prince camera and its companion projector, the Princess. Then, in February 1960, yet a new manager took over at Pathoscope, J. Warrington Pickard, the official receiver. At the 11th hour, the auction of the firm's assets was called off when Pathoscope was bought lock, stock and barrel by the great Universal Stores Group. But the building was soon sold again, and it's now the headquarters of Johnson's of Henley. The contents were removed to an East End warehouse, and Larry Pierce, who was then a part-time 9-5 dealer, was summoned there by a mysterious phone call. We went up in the lift, opened the doors, it was like an Aladdin's cave, crammed floor to ceiling with 9-5 equipment, printing machines, processing machines, just piled and thrown on top of each other, not even conserving space. But racks and racks of uh, projectors, cameras, practically the whole of the factory. They simply said, take what you want. In effect, what they wanted was the space. But Larry Pierce was too late to rescue much of Pathoscope's machinery. Most of it was scrapped, and believe it or not, some even finished up reinforcing foundations at London Airport. Three years later, Pathoscope and 9-5 parted company for good. Then 9-5ers found an unlikely ally in Ivan Watson, a writer who'd been christened the Bishop of the Bootlace because of his staunch devotion to 8mm. We had the idea of forming the 9-5 Association when we heard the disastrous news that the Pathoscope organisation would not in future be providing any more 9-5 films. To get the 9-5 Association going, we published an article in Amateur Cineworld and we asked for 9-5ers who would be interested to fill up a form and let us know whether they were prepared to buy an agreed amount of film per year. We had a very gratifying response. Over a thousand people filled these forms in and agreed to join the association. At this stage, we held an inaugural meeting of various interested people at the uh, home of Philip Jenkins, who was then technical consultant of Amateur Cinewell. 
and the general methods we would employ to put the Nine Fight Association into operation were agreed. The enthusiasts then took over and we have the position today where Nine Five still miraculously survives. I think we have to face the fact that Nine Five has been kept alive by the enthusiasm of a small band of people. Equally, it is a bit of a sleeping beauty. The great hope is that a Prince Charming, in the form of a rich manufacturer, will come along and espouse the cause of Nine Five. And then the pioneer gauge will take its rightful place. Ivan Watson's dream seemed close to reality in 1965 when David Cox of 3M spoke enthusiastically about his plans to promote 9.5mm, arrange a nationwide distribution network for camera film and back it up with an advertising campaign and a fast processing service. Alas, through no fault of Mr Cox, who now keeps a hotel in Great Yarmouth, the company never went ahead with its plans. The mid-sixties saw a big revival of interest in the first amateur gauge. Even though the world's leading manufacturers took little notice of it, 9.5 kept going, largely through the uncanny devotion of the people who used it. Even a small group of dealers who supported them seemed to be driven more by love of the gauge than by thought of profit. New manufacturers came into the field, and 9.5 was discovered by a new generation of enthusiasts. The fact that some people thought they were raving mad didn't seem to bother them. Fanning the flames of the 9.5 revival, as it came to be known, were two clubs. Amateur cinematograph operators, led by John Garnet Jones on the left, and Group 95, which organizes this annual gathering. One of the club's founders was Paul Van Sommer. I had used 95 uh, for some years while I lived in Kenya, both for filming and film collecting. And my arrival in this country in 59 uh, happened to coincide with the demise of Pasco. Uh, I came to London in 1962 and very soon met Larry Pierce and we felt that uh, there was a great need at that time for a national organization of 95 users and this led in September 1962 to the formation of Group 95. was a French invention and it's still to France that 9.5 has looked for most of their equipment. There the gauge is sustained by small manufacturers like André Ligoni who surprised the photographic world with his S2000, the first cine camera powered by solar cells. He also took the basic design of the Pathé Europe and a sound base from Ertier and produced the IM250S magnetic sound projector. Very little equipment is made in England, but after a gap of 11 years, we have come into the picture again with package film releases, which are no longer made even in France. And again, the initiative came not from big business, but from two enthusiasts who got together and formed Novascape. One of them, Patrick Mould. In the autumn of 1970, my partner, Paul Van Sommeren, and I were fortunate enough to find an old printer which had previously been used by Pathoscope. We overhauled this printer with a view to producing films in the way that Pathoscope originally produced them. In addition, we were also lucky enough, in conjunction with Larry Pierce, to obtain an old film perforator. This was soon working, and the only problem then was to arrange processing. To be a 9-5-er, you've just got to be an enthusiast. 
As one writer said, it's not so much a hobby, mate, it's more of a bloody religion.